Okay, welcome to Repair Cafe TV. I'm Don Fick and I'll be your host. And also this evening, I'm your presenter. Um, we've got uh, our, several of our repair coaches joining us. And in the audience, we have about 34 guests right now who are viewing. Uh, we are using the webinar format of Zoom, which means that um, you won't see most people on the screen at any time. But later on, as we're doing questions and answers, we will um, give you the chance to present your question by audio and or video. And then we'll also uh, be able to um, take questions from you throughout the program using the chat function. So you may see chat as an option on the bottom of the screen or from the more menu. If you do that right now, we can get a chance to see where everybody's calling in from tonight. So go ahead and type in uh, your city, state, country, wherever it is you happen to be. And we can uh, all take a look at the chat and see who, uh, where people are coming in from. Let's see, we've got... Uh, Everywhere from uh, the Hudson Valley to Washington State, uh, New Jersey, Raleigh, North Carolina, Oakland, California, Melbourne, Australia, Apex, North Carolina, Buffalo, New York, Monroe, New York. Brooklyn. Yay, we've got uh, Vermont, North Carolina, Massachusetts, Brazil, all right. Welcome, Brazil. I think you're our, our first guest from Brazil, so that's great. Um, all right, so thanks everybody for checking in. Um, and so uh, we've been doing these events throughout the summer. We hope to be doing a, a winter season as well. Um, there are other groups around the US and the world who are doing similar online repair workshops. And you can always find a list of those at repaircafe.tv. Um, we try to keep that updated whenever we know of something that's happening. They're usually done by Zoom. And so you can really dial in from home and ask questions and get advice from repair coaches around the world. So we've um, got my presentation, I guess I've been nervously preparing for. We're going to be talking about glue and um, glued adhesives. It's a really big subject and I'm not going to be covering everything. My goal is to try to present some glues and things that um, you're likely to find at a store near you. So we're not talking about any specialty glues or exotic glues. These are things that you can buy at the local home improvement store, hardware store, Walmart, Target, places like that. Crazy glue, you dirty rat. Strong enough to hold this man suspended in midair. Right, Ma? Hmm. Dodge almost anything. A plastic knob, a plastic plug, a rubber boot, a metal brooch, a fishing rod, a cycle grip, model planes and model trains, a doorknob screw, a flashlight case, the broken trim on any car. And now Crazy Glue also comes in a no-drip, no clog pen. The country's gone crazy. Crazy Glue in tube or pen. Crazy, crazy glue. So as we go through this presentation, it'll be a mix of pre-recorded video as well as me speaking live. Um, I'd like to invite our coaches to contribute comments as we go along. So ask you all not to hesitate if you'd like to shout out. And then for folks who are um, viewing from home, go ahead and uh, you can post comments in the chat. Here's our first video clip. Before we get started with any gluing project, we want to make sure that we have our work area set up correctly. So I've got a drop cloth here on my work surface in case I spill any glue. I also want to keep in mind that I need to clean up pretty quickly if I make a mistake. So if I'm using water-based glue, I have a wet rag that's just damp but not dripping wet. But if I'm using a solvent-based glue, I need to have something more appropriate to cleaning up a, solve, cleaning up a uh, spill. So I've got um, a couple choices here. I've got mineral spirits acetone and goof off goof off is primarily a xylene based solvent um, all of these are volatile organic compounds so you want to make sure that you're using these as well as the respective glue in an area that's well ventilated so you should be doing it outdoors or with adequate um, indoor ventilation these compounds do um, cause some potential dizziness nausea or headaches if you experience any of that quickly move to an area with better ventilation and get some fresh air you're also gonna to wanna to protect your hands. So I can recommend um, using nitrile gloves, the, typically the blue kind of uh, gloves. These are going to be more resistant to chemicals. If you only have latex gloves, keep in mind that latex is not a good barrier to petroleum-based compounds such as these. And so you wanna change them frequently. Um, best to save these just for use with water-based adhesives. All right, so those are the, the three um, uh, cleanup products, solvent products that I'm using. I usually reach for mineral spirits. Um, I will warn you that uh, from my experience in preparing for tonight, I did find that if you're working with any polystyrene plastics, those are the ones labeled PS, 
um, the goof off or the acetone will damage the finish on those plastics. So um, generally the mineral spirits are the least harsh among these. Also want to emphasize that um, safety is important as we're working through um, anything with, uh, with glues and these solvents. So please read and follow the manufacturer's instructions. Um, I'm not a glue professional. Um, what you're hearing from me is just mostly my opinion from experience and using these products and evaluating them. Um, and so uh, always follow the manufacturer's instructions. We want to make sure you have adequate fresh air and keep in mind that um, cloth masks don't block volatile organic compounds. So um, don't rely on that to protect you in, a, in an area where you don't have adequate ventilation. A lot of times we use clamps when we're gluing, and so these are a few suggestions for clamps. Um, a single hand operated bar clamp is a really convenient thing to have, and they're not terribly expensive. You can get them at stores like Harbor Freight for just a few dollars. I actually bought a set at the Aldi supermarket um, in Cary, North Carolina. So you can, you can find them without spending a lot of money. Great to have. Um, painter's tape works in a pinch, as long as you don't accidentally glue the tape to the, pro to the uh, work piece. Uh, chip clips, those kind of um, spring clips that you might use to close a bag of potato chips can work as a clamp. Um, telephone books, if you actually have any of those. So those are just a few ideas for, uh, for clamping. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, set time versus cure time when we talk about glues. So set time is, of course, the, well, is the time that it takes for the glue to begin um, solidifying or getting tacky. It's really um, the time between when you start working with it and your set time is your working time. That's how much time you have to position your item. Um, after that, cure time is when that glue reaches its maximum strength. Okay, so uh, the first glues we're gonna talk about are white glues or polyvinyl acetate glues, like Elmer. Um, Elmer's glue is actually a pretty serious glue um, as we, uh, see in this commercial from earlier. Let's see. You're about to see a test of strength. We're gluing these beams together with Elmer's glue all. No nails, no bolts. Will the Elmer's hold? Let's see. Look, the Elmer's held. Elmer's was stronger than the wood itself stronger than you'll ever need for most household jobs. Elmer's, America's favorite glue. So you may recognize a family similarity between Elmer on the right and Elsie the cow on the left. Elsie, the mascot of Borden's milk. Um, it turns out that Elmer's glue was originally also uh, made from contented cows. Um, but wait, maybe not in the way you think. So. Um, the original Elmer's glue was made from casein, a protein found in milk. Um, and so, uh, and for many years, that's what it was based on until the 1960s or so when they switched over to a synthetic formula using polyvinyl acetate. So Elmer's assures us that their product is vegan friendly. Um, there are no actual cows harmed in the production of Elmer's glue. Elmer's is just one example of what are generally called white glues or polyvinyl acetate glues. These are water-based glue. Um, they're great for use with paper and wood. They don't alter the pH of paper, so that's a real plus. They're very popular with um, people who work in paper and book cons uh, conservation. And um, they are notably best for interior use. So these are, as they describe themselves, household glues. Um, you'll see there on the left, Aileen's Tacky Glue is well-known among craft uh, folks, crafters. It, both of these glues are available most everywhere and they have incredibly long sh shelf lives. Um, as I look around the house, I found multiple bottles of Elmer's glue, but I don't remember buying any of them. And yet they're all still working, still good bo bottles of glue. So um, it did make me wonder, I wasn't familiar with Aileen's Tacky Glue. I was able to get it at Walmart very easily. And uh, so I was curious what the difference between them was. One of the things to note about water-based glues is that they have a significant amount of moisture in them. And that can have an effect on the item that you're trying to glue, especially if it's paper, which may curl or wrinkle from the presence of the excess water. It may also be difficult with some woods that if you have uh, too much water in the glue. So I wanted to do a little bit of a test and understand the difference between the two. 
One of the things to look for in a PVA glue or a white glue is how much moisture there is in it. The moisture could have an effect on the material that you're trying to glue. So the, your substrate, whether it's paper, wood, or something else, will absorb a lot of the moisture that's contained in the glue. It also affects the drying time. Um, the more moisture, of course, will take longer to dry. So one of the things we can do here to try to understand the difference between Elmer's glue wall and Aileen's original tacky glue is a somewhat unscientific test. Let's pour a teaspoon of each onto a plate and see how viscous they are. Now let's go ahead and stand up the plates and see which one runs first. <clears throat> so that's an important consideration when placing glue on a work piece. You want to make sure it stays where you want it and doesn't run elsewhere. So um, if we're working with wood and maybe doing furniture repair, um, the next thing to look at is carpenter glues, which are typically the same as Elmer's or Aileen's glue with additives. They're known for being yellow in color. Of course, Elmer's does make versions of these. And another brand that you'll see widely is Typon. Um, it is important to note that all of these come in different varieties. There is wood glue for interior use and then wood glue for interior and exterior use. So if you're going to pick up one of these and if it's going to sit on the shelf for 10 years, grab the exterior version. Um, type Bond comes in three different strengths. Um, type Bond number three here at the top is, um, has the highest waterproof rating. Um, none of these are designed to be immersed in water continuously. But um, it is worth considering, uh, you know, the context that you may be using the glue. And since it does have a long shelf life, go for the exterior grade. That would be either the Wood Glue Max from Elmer's or the uh, Blue Type Bond 2 or 3. Let's see. All right, switching gears a bit, we're going to take a look at Sugru. Now, I had never heard of Sugru before getting involved with the Repair Cafe. And it turns out to be kind of a, a interesting hybrid glue uh, moldable material. And uh, here's the inventor of Sugru to explain. This is Sugru. It's moldable glue that bonds to almost any other material. And overnight, it turns into a strong, durable rubber. One of our customers described it best when they said, if superglue and Play-Doh had a love child, then this would be it. It's soft enough to mold into any shape, yet durable enough to fix almost anything. I invented it to make fixing and making easy for everyone. Okay, so um, Sugru is um, available at Target, so it is easy to find. Um, and here is a couple applications that we have done at Repair Cafe in the past to explain it. Sugru might be one of the more interesting glues and adhesive to come up in recent years. It's maybe more like a modeling clay of sorts that turns into a flexible rubber. So it comes in a small pack. Within you get three individual foil packed pieces of Sugru. Um, once you open the package, you only have that day to use it. It will dry out and become hard rubber. Um, it is a very small amount compared to the price. It is about $12 for a pack of three. I'll demonstrate two of the places where we found it to be most useful in Repair Cafe. Okay, so here's one of the first uses for Sugru. We're looking at a uh, MacBook Pro power supply, and the cable is beginning to fray. And so what we can do is create our own strain relief around where the cable joins with the um, connector, and that'll help to uh, reinforce this and prevent it from fraying any further. So we'll just go ahead and clip off some of the excess material that we have here in the insulation of the cord, and then open up our Sugru pack. So this is about $4 worth of Sugru. Not a whole lot. It's very pliable. You can knead it, mush it around here a bit, work it. Um, we're going to do use just a little bit. And what I'm going to do is break that off. You don't have to worry about it drying too quickly. It does take overnight to dry. So you don't have limited working time. Let's go ahead and start getting this onto the workpiece here.
That's going to bond very nicely to the aluminum. Now, we don't want it to interfere with the chassis of the Macintosh, so we're just going to smooth that down along that axis there. And that's it. We'll set that aside. The suitcase come in, and um, the, uh, the rubber on the caster or the rollerblade-style wheel had begun to come off. It was a much smaller wheel than this, but we were able to begin using some Sugru and fill in the broken piece of wheel. So that um, did adhere very well to this kind of material. And we can just uh, begin to press that into place. And if you're able to get a smooth, continuous surface with the existing rubber, you can get a nice rolling effect there without having um, a bumpy wheel. So it kind of fills in a nice little patch on a, on a broken caster or roller blade wheel on a luggage or something else. Okay, so um, that was Sugru. Um, one, another glue that we always have on hand at Repair Cafe is Shugu. So we, we get a lot of uh, email requests uh, come preparing for tonight. Um, how can I repair my shoes, sandals, sneakers, hiking shoes? Um, and Shugu is always our go-to solution. Now, we don't have the benefit of having a, a full cobbler's workbench of tools. This is pretty much our only shoe tool. And um, it's, a, it's a great synthetic um, glue. It's, um, an, this is the first of the glues we're looking at that is solvent-based. So it's going to have a very strong odor. Um, but it does remain flexible after it dries, and it is clear. Um, so it's important to clean off any excess that you may get on the shoe before it dries. Um, for that, mineral spirits on a rag is, is a good choice. Um, but it's, it's definitely a go-to solution and uh, commonly available in, um, in most uh, Walmarts, um, maybe not home improvement stores, but certainly hardware stores. All right, one of our favorites by far is E6000. So um, E6000 glues, Pretty much everything and very similar to shoe goo it is it dries clear and it dries flexible um, which is a, a great virtue it has i think in my mind has virtually replaced hot glue as a solution for most folks um, and uh, one of the things i've i've been able to confirm with a bunch of the testing i did this week is it does resist peeling now peeling when it comes to glue where we have two materials and then you apply a force to split them apart um, is a, is a weakness to a lot of glues because that leading edge of the peel has a lot of force applied to it and the glue gives up quickly. Um, E6000 does not, so that's a, a particular virtue. Um, and I should note that all of the glues I'm talking about tonight are intended to be permanent glues. So um, expect that whatever you place this on or wherever you spill this glue, um, it's going to be there for a long time. Um, it turns out there are imitators to E6000. Um, you can find B6000, um, J7000. Um, so it's important to take a look carefully and make sure you're getting E6000. Uh, one place that came up last Repair Cafe TV, we were talking about jewelry and it was um, recommended as a good glue to use when adhering um, stones to uh, materials. It has a bit more give than some of the super glues, which we'll talk about in a minute. So um, it can kind of handle a little bit more rough and tumble in some, uh, some respects. One comment about E6000, if you, when you use it, it takes about a week for the smell of the solvent to really go away, but it's good stuff. Yeah, it, it is, it, it is um, definitely one of the stronger solvents. So we're gonna take a jump now to um, super glues. And um, I wanted to touch on these. Pretty much um, everybody has had some experience with super glue. I think my earliest experiences all involved gluing my fingers together and then running for mom's nail polish remover. So um, super glues are generally, the, they're in the category of cyanoacrylates. So I'll probably use that term a lot. Um, cyanoacrylates are offered by pretty much every glue brand and most of the glues that come in small packages are going to be cyanoacrylates. I was almost going to exclude them, but uh, one of my ad advisors here uh, recommended that um, it's, it's a good go-to glue for almost any household task. And I have found that to be true. It is a good choice. Um, it does have some disadvantages. So 
It has got a very short shelf life. One, a new bottle unopened will last about a year. Opened will only last about maybe four weeks to a few months. I, I, Don, I keep mine in the refrigerator, and I've had open bottles that have lasted four or five years. Oh, really? Uh, without any problem. Well, that's a good suggestion because we do have a, a question later on about how to make glues um, last longer. So that's a great suggestion. Um, it tends to be create a bond that is brittle. So it's not a bond that you're going to be able to use on a flexible material like a shoe as much as like shoe goo, which is going to flex with the shoe. Um, it has a relatively short working time. So that this is a glue that sets up fast and it does um, you know, begin to bond immediately when you place the two items together. <coughs> Um, it is a good choice for hard plastics, and we'll talk about plastics a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, okay, so moving on, let's, oh, okay, so I'm gonna be talking about three different glues, uh, three different super glues. So Crazy Glue, um, of course, is probably well known for its brand name. Um, one option is though you can buy inexpensive super glue, cyanoacrylate glue, um, at a dollar store in small tubes so, um, you know, to get kind of more use out of your purchase, you can almost think of each tube as being nearly disposable. It's such a small volume that you don't mind that it's going to dry out soon after you open it. Or you use Bob's recommendation, put it in the fridge. Um, Rapid Fuse is a relatively new um, mix of super glue. It's from DAP and um, it's getting extraordinarily good reviews. It provides more working time. The glue doesn't set for about 30 seconds. So it allows you to play and reposition your item to get it exactly right before the glue starts to set up. And then it does cure in about 30 minutes. So that is actually the glue that I used to bond the, uh, the PVC to the polystyrene. Let's take a look at an example of using it to fix a coffee cup. Okay, let's take a look at some cyanoacrylate glues. Now these are our super glues is you can find at uh, inexpensive dollar stores, you can find multi-packs of small tubes. You can almost think of these as single use um, because they uh, will you know, probably dry out or clog up before you have a chance to use the whole thing. So this is perhaps a more classic application for a, a straight up cyanoacrylate super glue. We have a co coffee cup with a broken handle. So here we're gonna be food safe because our beverage is not going to come in contact with our glue joint. So that should be a place where we're pretty comfortable using a super glue without concern for its toxicity. Let's give that a try. The inexpensive dollar store super glue. And I'm taking a chance doing this barehanded. I'm hoping I don't glue my fingers together. So we'll put some on each surface, just a drop. And we'll go ahead and put the handle on. Take a little bit of movement to get it in the right spot. There we go. And that's it. We're just gonna keep that in that position. In fact, I can really let go of it and keep the cup in that orientation and let that dry. This cup was repaired using the cyanoacrylate um, glue the uh, dollar store super glue. Now notice that there is some fogging that has developed on this uh, blue cup. It's very conspicuous. That's called blooming, and that's a common side effect of using a cyanoacrylate super glue. Um, let's see if we can take that off with some acetone. Okay, that looks like that worked. The acetone did take off most of that blooming. That blooming was probably the result of me using a little too much glue in that particular joint. Okay. So yeah, I found that um, in, in preparing these videos, I did often use more glue than I should. And uh, in the case of glue, especially cyanoacrylate glues, less is more. So that is something to keep in mind. Don. Yes. Um, uh, I'm assuming that super glue is not food safe. Is that true? Yeah, I was going to touch on that. Actually, I'll go ahead and jump to that slide. Um, yeah, so no, cyanoacrylates are not considered food safe. Um, and I, I did a little bit of kind of deep dive onto this and I, I suspect that in practical applications, your exposure risk to cured superglue is going to be minimal. 
Um, now, in the case of the cup where it's in the handle, the handle is not coming in contact with the beverage. So that's, you know, next to zero risk. Now, sure. um, but um, in the case where you may be putting it on a platter or something where it's coming into contact with food, um, you may want to consider um, some other options. And I'll demonstrate um, the uh, JB Quick Weld, uh, I'm sorry, JB Clear Weld, which is a food safe glue. Um, and that's a two part epoxy. We'll take a look at that um, in just a minute. Don, could, could yep. that cup go through a dishwasher? It should be able to go through a dishwasher, yes. I, unfortunately, I didn't run it through myself, um, but it, it should be dishwasher safe, yeah. Let's, um, now, of course, you know, many times you've seen the, uh, the demonstration of a car being lifted with super glue. Let's see if that's really true. Now we're going for a 5,000 pound pickup truck, plus a 1,400 pound steel safe. Only 10 drops of glue are holding these two hanging beams together. You guys ready? Yeah. We're ready. We're ready. Let's do it. All right. I don't know. I think it might fall. Oh, oh, oh. oh, that happened oh, quick. Oh. Darn. Darn. You know what? Well, that didn't, oh. that didn't get very far. Didn't get very far at all. I don't think that's going to hold it. There's a couple of things that can make a cyanoacrylate glue bond break. It's shear and peeling. So shear is when, instead of pulling straight, you pull sideways from the bond. And we demonstrated that that can cause that same glue bond to break. The other thing that'll cause it to break is a peeling effect. So if one edge of the bond begins to break, and then that torque acts like a zipper, peels the whole thing apart, it all catastrophically fails, and stuff comes falling out of the sky. And it was a peeling effect that caused these I-beams to pull apart. We know that the machined pistons worked well for the bungee test, so we're gonna give that another shot. For our new rig, we have machined two pistons to give them much smoother surface areas for a tighter seal. Robert applies just 10 drops of super adhesive before gluing the pistons together. Do you think that these pistons just glued together are gonna be able to lift a two and a half ton truck? It's probably not something I would try. Anybody behind the glue? Anyone? Yeah. There's not a lot of support for this. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> Derek, you ready? Yes, sir. All right, go ahead. This time, we'll start easy and try it without the additional weight of the safe. There it goes. He's up. He's up. up. He's up. All, right. All right. Come on. Now, how long is it going to hold? How long is it going to hold? Unbelievable. 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 All right, Derek, you want to take a little higher? Let's go. Woohoo! All right. Yes. Step it up. Cyan <laughs> I thought for sure. I'd like to thank uh, the Science Channel for my unauthorized reuse of that clip. So, um, yeah, so it is a fair question. You know, what about those situations where super glue is not a good choice, whether because it's not food safe or um, it's not appropriate for the item that you're working with? Um, super glue is going to work really well when you have two surfaces, as we saw in that video that are um, perfect matches to each other. So in my broken teacup handle, um, the, the fracture on one side was a perfect match to the other. Sometimes that's not the case. There may be um, some material missing or you're trying to rejoin something that's been damaged in some way beyond a simple crack. And so then we get into two-part epoxies. Um, JB Weld is usually the brand that we're going for at Repair Cafe. The first one on the left is the original JB Weld. Um, a good choice for bonding together metals and uh, pretty much anything. Um, it does have a longer cure time than JB Quick. So we go for the Quick Weld, um, typically at Repair Cafe because we don't have all day. Um, we want to help our guests get their item fixed and go on with their day. So um, JB Quick Weld has a shorter um, set time and a, a faster cure time. So, um, but in the case of dealing with ceramics, if we're trying to um, fix uh, a plate, a platter, um, something else, we're going to use the clear weld. So let's see how clear weld works. And this is going to be similar to any two-part epoxy. Um, the process that you see me using here is going to be what you would use for anything that comes similarly packaged as two tubes that need to be mixed together. 
since cyanoacrylates, oops, all right, we um, can't use them in food preparation areas, we need to look for a glue that is food safe if we want to be able to, uh, to mend a, uh, a broken cup or a platter. So JB Clear Weld is the go-to in this case. Sold in a plunger with dual barrel plunger. Um, this helps you make sure that you get exactly the same ratio of the two products. You have a resin and an activator. And so uh, usually we'll, in this case, we're going to mix it before we apply it. So I recommend using a coated paper plate, something you can dispose of when you're finished. We're going to squirt some of this onto the plate and then um, mix it up with a, uh, a popsicle stick and then apply it to the platter. Get it thoroughly mixed. It's all in uniform color. And we may need to mix up a couple batches of this. You don't want to mix up more than you can use at a time. So here is a platter that we, are, we want to glue. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start working with just one piece at a time. All right, definitely I did press some glue out, which I don't want to be visible on the top of the plate when we're finished here. So I'm going to set that down and I'm going to see if I can clean some of that up with some uh, acetone. Now acetone is exactly the same as nail polish remover. Crack is basically invisible. It's very hard to see where that might have been. Now I will say, um, to answer Tom's question also about it being food safe. So this may be the preferred route to go in fixing a platter where you want to be able to, to prepare or serve food on it. Um, it, I did find it generally to be a little bit more difficult to get a clean joint with the, um, the clear weld because it is thicker. So there's generally more material going down as opposed to the um, inexpensive dollar store super glue, which goes on almost like water. So um, that is something to keep in mind. You know, again, with glue, less is more. Hi, Don. Yeah. Do they have, do they sell like glue in like separate bottles? Because I've always had really trouble with those plunger dispensers. I find they get glued together and then it's like, it's pretty useless after that. Yeah, I wanted to show that. So here's the, the clear weld. I have to say that JB Weld does have a better packaging than a lot of these double barreled plunger type um, because it, the cap does twist on and so it doesn't fall off as easily. And I do find that so far, it's kept these two separate and I haven't had any clogging problems. Okay. Um, but uh, yes, I, you'd have to shop around. JB Weld does sell things in separate packages. I don't know specifically if the Clear Weld comes in a, in a different package. All right, so I wanted to touch on fabric glues and I, I've had the chance to play with fabric glues on a few different materials. Um, and it was a question of uh, Fabric Fusion, which is a product from Aileen's, also a water-based glue, but not a white PVA glue. Instead, Fabric Fusion is a water-based urethane glue, and then versus E6000 as a fabric glue. And I encourage you to consider both of these, um, both dry, clear, and flexible. In fact, it's almost indistinguishable if you were to, to set a bead of each of these side by side and let them dry, um, it's almost impossible to tell the difference. But Fabric Fusion is water-based, so easier to clean up, no fumes. Um, E6000, as Bob has mentioned, uh, quite a smelly glue. Um, I did try them in a few different cases. Um, I found they both work well, especially on porous materials. So I was able to bond fabric and leather together very easily. Um, I found the E6000 much better for vinyl. I think probably because of the solvent components of the E6000 bound you know, bound better to the synthetic of the vinyl. Um, whereas fabric fusion, because it was water-based, the moisture from the glue was trapped between the layers of vinyl and did not cure for a long time. So um, in, the, in that particular case, E6000 was the winner. Um, but both are uh, dish, uh, were washer and dryer safe and um, good choices. So um, let's go on to heavier, heavier duty glues. So um, 
One of my favorites is polyurethane construction glues. Now that may be the kind of projects I often find myself in um, and, uh, and I want large volumes of glue. So, you, but you can buy it in a couple different packages. And these are two brands, um, Loctite's PL or Proline polyurethane premium construction adhesive or Liquid Nails heavy duty construction adhesive. I have heard that um, in California, it may be difficult to get these particular glues because of their VOC components and they're being reformulated. Um, I'm in North Carolina, so I'm using the local uh, traditional formula. Um, these are great glues for construction contexts where you might be bonding together uh, wood. And um, if you're doing wood repair and if the carpenter's glue is not working for you, then this is a good one to grab. These glues will um, bind to your substrate stronger than the substrate itself. And um, if you're working with wood and you use it in combination with screws, um, using a combination kind of glue and screw method, um, you're going to get an exceptionally strong bond. Here's an example of using it to fix some brick, which may be something you would have in a piece of broken statuary or some outdoor masonry work that you'd like to fix. So this is one of my favorite glues. It's polyurethane construction adhesive. Um, this is in a metal tube. It's sealed in the end. So you're gonna use the puncture um, tool that's built into the cap to open this up. And this is a uh, solvent-based adhesive. It's not um, high in solvent. It's gonna flow a little bit like peanut butter. Um, but if you do make a mistake or you need to remove it from uh, any material, uh, mineral spirits is recommended for taking this off. And so we squeeze it out here. And in this case, we're going to be putting it on um, just enough to form a bond between the two materials, but not so much that it squeezes out when we, um, glue, when we press them together. And you'll see it kind of comes out with sort of a texture, like I said, similar to peanut butter. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to get it all the way around. In this case, since we're bonding something that's going to be outdoors, we wanna make sure that we don't leave a void for water to fill and later for it to form ice and to break the brick apart again. So uh, we wanna make sure that we get it all the way around the perimeter. Anytime we're doing a project like this with a thicker glue, you may want to anticipate having a spreader on hand. Um, almost anything will do. I've used pencil points in the past or um, anything you find laying around that you're happy to dispose of later. Um, in this case, I have a wooden popsicle stick. Um, that's gonna be a great way to make sure that we get this spread around. This kind of polyurethane construction adhesive has some decent working time to it, so it, we're not in a hurry. Um, it will eventually form a skin and then uh, it'll start to set up. Um, overnight is really where you're gonna see the, the maximum holding power start to kick in. Um, we get that spread around there. And we're gonna try to get it on both sides so that we've got it really kind of filled into all the nooks and crannies of this broken brick. This does come in a couple different formulations and I recommend looking for the one that's designed for interior and exterior use. There are some interior only um, and so you wanna make sure, especially since um, this has decent shelf life, this project tube can be capped and it'll last for a couple years. So get the interior and exterior type um, also, uh, make sure it is polyurethane premium construction adhesive or polyurethane heavy duty construction adhesive. Um, that's what you want to look for. There are a lot of similar looking products on the market. Um, so let's go ahead and sit these together. And I'm going to press them together. There's a little bit of seeping there that's happening. That's okay. All right, so I probably could have used a little bit less than what I used in this case. But I'm going to leave that there. And we're just going to set that aside for that to set up a little bit. Okay, now it's been about 30 or 40 minutes since I glued the brick together. And I've allowed some of the, the excess material to solidify. It's not solid yet. It's kind of a, a tarry sort of um, taffy-like texture but now it's no longer going to be wet to the touch. It's formed a, a thick skin. I can take a putty knife now and remove some of that excess without really creating a mess. So we're just gonna kind of gently push that putty knife against there. It's going to lift up that excess and we're just going to pick that away. There we go. Okay, so definitely one of my favorites. I've always got a tube of that laying around. 
Okay, now I know um, in our email feedback that we got from folks before tonight, um, Dennis in particular wants to know about, whoops, this favorite topic. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Plastics. Gluing plastics can be very difficult. Um, first key step is knowing what kind of plastic you're working with. Now, lately around my house, this has been a major topic, um, drain, waste, and vent pipes. And so I figured this is not too far out of the scope of what a lot of us can do in our homes. And so I wanted to take a couple minutes and talk about this. So maybe a not so common household repair is plumbing repair. And in plumbing, we have quite a bit of plastic, which is glued together. Um, here we've got some samples of PVC, polyvinyl chloride, that's typically white. It can be gray and schedule 80 PVC. And then we've got um, ABS plastic. Um, ABS is um, the same kind of plastic that's used in Lego building blocks. So you know these are hard plastics. Um, and they are relatively easy to glue. The, um, these you will typically find in drain waste and vent applications inside a house. So this is going to be typically the pipes that are coming off of a toilet or a sink or might be leading to uh, an exhaust vent. Gluing these together is not difficult. I'm going to invite Louie McPherson of Ewing Irrigation to demonstrate with this YouTube video. Making the proper glue joint is simple if you follow these few steps. First, you make sure you remove all the burrs from the pipe that you're going to be gluing. The next step is the proper size dauber. They recommend using half the diameter of the PVC pipe that you're going to be gluing. Now we're ready to apply the primer. This step is often missed, but it's very important because it helps soften and clean the PVC pipe to prepare it for the glue. When applying the primer, start with the fitting. Go a few times around to get, make sure you get the proper coverage. Then go to the PVC pipe, do the same. Then once more, go back to the fitting. Now we're ready to apply the glue. You're going to start with the PVC pipe this time. Go a few times around just like the primer. Then to the fitting, a few times around, then back to the pipe itself. When you go to insert, give it a quarter of a turn and hold this for 30 seconds so there's no pushback. After the 30 seconds, get a towel or a rag and wipe off the excess glue so that it doesn't eat away at the PVC pipe itself. That's all there is to it. Make sure you use the proper dauber size and don't forget the primer. Now ABS plastic and PVC are both commonly found in homes, probably PVC more frequently than ABS. Um, they um, cannot be glued together. So it is important to note that although you may be able to create a bond with the glue and you may find glues in the store that are designed for both, um, it is not up to building code to have these glued together inside of a home. So instead you do need to use a coupler and so this is an example of such a coupler which um, will tie together your PVC with your ABS plastic with two hose clamps. Um, this is just a flexible rubber coupler, um, but um, very easy to use, very convenient, and so keep that in mind. A lot of times you'll find you'll get a leak around a joint where if you were to have to go back and cut out and replace all the necessary piping to replace the joint, you're looking at quite a bit of work, perhaps tearing into the wall or getting much more involved than you feel comfortable with. And so in three out of four cases, what I've done is taken advantage of JB Water Weld. So water weld is a putty that can be used to seal up leaks even in a wet environment. So let's take a look at how this works. This is a two-part putty that comes wrapped in um, plastic. You have to um, cut off the amount that you're going to use and then seal it up because it does last a good long time. Um, I've had tubes of this sit on the shelf for a couple of years and been able to go back to it and, and use it like it was new. It may dry out a little bit on the end, so you can just cut that off. And with these two-part putties, they work a lot like a two-part epoxy. We're going to knead them together in order to activate them. It's not unusual for this to begin getting warm while working with it. Make sure that the two parts are thoroughly mixed together and we have a single uniform color. So that's pretty good. Now what we're going to do is roll it out. And what I usually try to do is to uh, get at least halfway, if not all the way around the pipe to get a kind of a good band of adhesive on there. 
And so if we imagine that the crack is right along this joint here, we lay this in, and this is while you're in the wall, so you're kind of reaching up or into the wall, wherever this might be, in a crawl space or wherever it is. It's a little bit sticky, but that's good. You want it to go where you need it to be. And then you're gonna press it in to that seam, to that crack, and work that all the way around. And so you just lay that in there and press that in. And you have some decent working time. It will begin to set up um, in about three to five minutes. So you can work it and I usually try to press it in, smooth it out, make sure there are no air bubbles in there and that you're getting a nice smooth fit covering the, uh, the crack to both sides. But I wouldn't expect a plumber to come in and do this for you, um, but it is effective in my experience. You can seal up a leak and get that wall closed up. It seems to me these kinds of things, these leaks always happen on a Friday afternoon out of a holiday weekend. And rather than be stuck with a leaky pipe for four days, you can uh, get yourself back in business. And I can say I've got a piece here that I work on. Um, this stuff does set up hard as a rock. So it's, um, it's really pretty impressive. Um, and it has, uh, it has saved me on those three occasions. So um, but now let's talk about the plastics you're more likely to find around the house. Um, and uh, let's see. What I've tried to do throughout this section on plastics is to include the little um, recycling codes. So you have a, a guide a little bit on how to match up the right product to the specific plastic that you're working with. Um, and so I will make these available as a PDF. You can download these slides after this. Oh, the, uh, and Susan asks, what was the name of that last product? That was JB Water Weld. Um, I know I'm starting to sound like I'm selling uh, JB products, but um, they haven't failed. So um, I'm pretty happy with them. So we've got, um, first set of plastics, these are some of those hard plastics. And if you're not using water weld to bond them together, um, we've got uh, polystyrene, uh, PVC, and ABS. Um, these are some examples you'll find kind of hard plastic uh, paper trays, Lego blocks. Um, and as I demonstrated earlier with the paper tray and the PVC pipe, reaching for a cyanoacrylate glue is a good choice. Um, the, uh, and so these are the two that we've been discussing, the crazy glue or the rapid fuse. Rapid fuse gives you a little bit longer working time um, and it's been getting great reviews. So uh, I also have had that bottle of rapid fuse for at least 18 months, maybe close to two years and it's still liquid and ready to go. Next one we'll take a look at is styrofoam. So it's the end of the summer and you may have a cheap styrofoam cooler that somebody put their foot through um, styrofoam is very vulnerable to solvents. And so what we've found is um, you're going to want to use a water-based glue or I have had very good success using um, the polyurethane glue. So even though the polyurethane glue has some solvent in it, it doesn't seem to be enough to really adversely affect the styrofoam. And I can get really good bonds between styrofoam and styrofoam or styrofoam and plywood. Um, and that seems to work really well. But um, the uh, Aliens Tacky Glue is an excellent choice for gluing you know, your basic white styrofoam together. Oh, so there's a couple questions. Oh, okay, there's, a, there's some side conversation on chat about bonding vinyl. I'll let that go on. And um, so uh, as we go along now, we're getting into tougher and tougher plastics to try to bond. As we look at um, polypropylene and polyethylene terephthalate, try to say that five times fast. Um, there is JB Weld, sorry, sound like a broken record, JB Weld Plastic Bonder. And I did put this to work on um, this uh, polypropylene Adirondack chair. This JB Weld Plastic Bonder is sold in a two barrel syringe with a twist off cap. We can measure out 50-50 mix. It is marketed in a couple different colors. I did buy the brown. To assist with application, I'm going to try using a chip brush. We're going to attempt to apply this sparingly to both Ooh. sides of the crack. We don't want a lot of excess. So we're going to just put this right along the top and bottom of the crack.
Now we're going to line up the crack here and clean off the excess and set a clamp. JB Plastic Bonder does say that it is able to fill cracks, so I've allowed some additional mix to set up for a few minutes, and I'll see if we can try to uh, place this in a crack to get some additional bond. And we'll wipe off the excess with some mineral spirits. This will take 15 minutes to set, and we'll let it dry overnight. So one of the things that I did find with this is that first attempt at gluing it worked, but it didn't work extremely well. I didn't feel like it was a completely solid joint. This particular product um, benefits by actually using more. So if you're not afraid with an unsightly repair, you can really lay this on. Um, so on the back side of the chair, the underneath, I did put on another thick layer of the plastic weld. And if you wanted to go even a step further and put some sort of graft on this front facing side. So whether a small piece of steel um, or another bit of plastic that you could glue on top of the crack to join it together. Um, this glue does set up hard very quickly. Um, within 30 minutes, it was dry and sandable. So it was an extremely hard material and probably worth trying for your very difficult to fix plastics. So as we move from the hard plastics to the slightly softer plastics, um, gluing them gets more difficult. And that's really just more a matter of the chemistry of the polymer of the plastic, which I can't get into because I don't know the chemistry well enough. Um, but one way to kind of know what you're up against is if you get a sense that you can kind of scratch the plastic with your fingernail, you're, you're getting toward the softer plastics. Um, the most difficult plastics to work with are going to be um, polyethylene. Uh, and um, I did try to put this to work on polyethylene and um, it worked maybe. Um, I had some HDPE plastic. Um, I glued two sheets together and it was a reasonably strong bond if I pulled on it. So it had some good shear strength, but um, it did not have good peel strength. So if I were to pull the two layers apart, it would be pretty easy to separate. And that's just because simply none of the, none of the glues are going to make a good bond with polyethylene. Um, and that explains partly why most of the glue containers themselves are made of polyethylene. So um, it is just, uh, you know, I guess for every, um, uh, you know, every superhero has its kryptonite and in the case of glue, it's polyethylene. So we had a question um, about how to, how to loosen any of these bonds, these glues, after you've used one of these products. Um, usually you can look up the material safety data sheet for any of these products and there will be a suggestion of different solvents that you could use. Um, if you take a look at the JB Weld website, there is, um, for each product, there is an SDS or a specifications page, and there will be a list at the bottom of that page of solvents that separate them. Um, probably the one that's most commonly available in a hardware store might be toluene, um, but that's a, a very strong organic solvent, and that may work in separating something that you have glued together. All right, um, we're gonna get into um, a few of uh, the specific questions that came in by email. And I'm sorry if I don't cover the question that you sent in, um, but we've got um, a, a bunch of different questions that came in. So first one is uh, a vintage wooden chair with loose dowels. So the joinery of the chair has come loose. And I think safe to say uh, the first go-to glue in that case is going to be a PVA type glue. That's a white glue. Um, I, I would, at this point, I've become a convert. I think I want to start using Aileen's original tacky glue for a lot of things, and I would try that. Um, or the carpenter glues, the um, yellow glues, whether it's Elmer's or tight bond, um, I think those would be go-to glues for fixing a wooden chair. As a backup, if those dowels pull out again, um, I would then go a step up to the polyurethane construction adhesive, keeping in mind that if you do have some material press out and you need to wipe it clean, you'll need to use a solvent like mineral spirits. And then you wanna be concerned about damaging the finish of an antique chair. So if it has a, especially an oil-based finish or any kind of varnish on it, you may end up damaging that with the mineral spirits that you're using to clean up the glue. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, ceramic items, we, we looked at fixing a mug or a plate. Um, and so just to recap, 
either the super glues or the JB clear weld are going to be options. So um, a hard plastic stand for a magnifying glass or lamp where the contact area is small. Um, this is going to be a tricky one. Now we can try a crazy glue or a super glue. Um, as mentioned before, they don't have great resistance to shearing and torque. So if it's a heavy lamp and it's hanging um, kind of with a, a, it's basically kind of a putting too much weight on that joint that could separate, at which point, um, I might even try for E6000 because of its flexibility, might be able to handle that torque without separating from the, uh, the piece. Um, we've got a suggestion from John Wackman that uh, carpenter's glue, especially type bond two is best in his experience, never using the white glue. Um, remove the old glue first. And that was in the case of fixing the wooden chair. So someone asked, I need to remove heavy glue from stone tiles that came off the tabletop and glue them back on. So it's difficult without knowing what kind of glue you might have on these old tiles. Um, goof off might be a good place to start. Um, being mostly xylene, you'll notice goof off smells a bit like old magic markers. Um, it's something that you might put on a rag and soak on to remove the glue. Um, you could also potentially try sanding the glue or removing it some other way. And then gluing that tile back down onto the coffee table or, or whatever it is, um, the premium uh, polyurethane glue or E6000. I, I did actually do both as a demo um, and I, both are, are rock solid. There's, there's no movement. I'm not gonna be able to pull that off easily. So um, both glues are, are good choices for getting um, a piece of ceramic tile down to plywood. Or How do you keep glue from drying out? Um, so it was suggested, and uh, we saw some folks on chat seconded the suggestion of keeping your super glue in the refrigerator. Um, I have found that if you're using a solvent-based glue, you can try to add a little bit of solvent back into it to moisten it. Um, it's going to depend on using the compatible solvent. So um, be sure to read the label, follow the manufacturer's instructions, um, check their website to see if you can find a suggestion for what kind of solvent it might be. It could be acetone, it could be toluene, um, even a little bit of uh, mineral spirits might help you thin up a, a thickening glue. In the case of um, PVC glue for doing plumbing pipes, I have found that acetone is a good choice for softening up those glues. Hey Don. Yes. I have heard that you can keep your glues in like a plastic baggie or a mason jar with kitty litter or rice in it. Have you ever tried that? I have not. Um, maybe the idea there is to keep down the humidity in that area. So it's like super glues in particular do set up in the presence of water, uh, you know, humidity in the air. So maybe that's the idea behind that, but I have not heard that. Anybody else hear, hear that? You can drop us a note in chat if you've ever tried that. Um, someone is looking for the fastest drying glue for wood. And this is similar to another question we got about um, a piece of decorative trim on a mirror and they wanted to be able to try to glue the trim back together um, and they wanted something that would set up fast. And so I did um, do some experiments. I know my video is probably small right now. I could uh, stop the video for just a moment here. Okay, so I did um, get some framing pieces and I did glue these together with three different glues. I used um, Aileen's Super Tacky Glue, I used E6000, and I used the DAP Rapid Fuse Super Glue. Um, I have to say, in the end, all of them came out with exceptionally strong bonds. I mean, I haven't pulled on them so far as to break them, but I was pretty satisfied that for um, decorative materials in the house, all three created a bond that was adequate. Um, the one that set up most quickly and allowed me to let go of it fastest was the rapid fuse, the cyanoacrylate based glue. Um, the uh, E6000 was a nice choice, but even the, um, the tacky glue with um, a little bit of bracing, what I did is I used some painter's tape to keep the, the joint together and let it dry overnight and it's been an excellent bond. We got a question about gluing scuba fabric and um, well actually the, the and I assume that they're talking about um, like a wetsuit material, like neoprene. 
and so um, I did kind of play around a little bit with this. I was able to get something which I think was neoprene and um, played with it. And I do think that E6000 was better than Aileen's Fabric Fusion for working with neoprene. Despite being a solvent-based glue, it did not seem to have a significant effect on the neoprene foam. Um, it did create a, a very nice flexible bond and it was, um, let's see, and it is designed to be resistant to salt water. Um, what I did is assuming that we have a slit in the material, um, creating a patch from some synthetic fabric and then gluing it down with E6000 and uh, ended up something that was very flexible, um, comfortable against the skin. It's not something that's going to um, be sharp and, uh, and it resists peeling very well. So um, I don't expect that tear to reopen. So that's a, a suggestion for fixing scuba material. But of course, with something as, as expensive as a wetsuit, um, check with the manufacturer. There are custom specialty glues for gluing together neoprene, but in our talk tonight, we're just looking at kind of common off the shelf glues. Um, and then a similar question, uh, question came up, you know, how can I identify which glue needs air and which does not? Well, pretty much all of these glues do need air. The solvent or the water needs to escape the glue for it to set, with the exception of super glues, um, where they're relying on uh, the presence of moisture in the air to set up. But, um, you know, they, these are all generally aerobic glues. And um, what I've found in, in the different test pieces I did preparing for tonight is that generally the water-based glues are going to be slower to dry um, but especially slow to dry if placed in synthetic materials. So for instance, using um, Aileen's Fabric Fusion, which is a water-based urethane glue on pieces of vinyl was pretty much a non-starter because once the perimeter of that glue set, the interior of the glue stayed wet for a couple days. And so that vinyl never really bound up. Whereas with the volatile organic compounds in the solvent-based glues, are able to evaporate out through the synthetic materials. And so they set up much nicer. So um, it's really mostly a mat matter of matching your glue to the substrate that you're trying to, to join and, um, and then giving it time. But uh, the synthetics are, I mean, I'm sorry, the solvents are generally going to set up faster. Okay, that's about it on, uh, on my comments about glue tonight. I, um, I, We'll make these slides available as a downloadable PDF. And then we will, um, there's also additional notes in the slides, which we won't go through tonight, but they're available. So can we um, answer any questions about glues? If you'd like to raise your hand, you can um, click the raise hand button and we can allow you to talk. Um, and I see Kathy has raised her hand. Kathy, are you there? Yes. Hey. Yeah. Question. Um, so I've I've glued some cabochons into metal settings. I don't know if you can see. Yes. Yeah. Pull back a little bit. Yep. And I've got remnants of dried glue around the outside of the stone, this little area. So I don't know if there's a way to remove the remnants of that dried glue. I don't remember what kind of glue I used. Hmm. Um. And do you know what kind of stone it is? They're semi-precious stones. Um, yeah, so you should be okay using a solvent. And what is the, the backing? It's, um, this one is a base metal. So I might start really softly. Um, well, first, is it flexible, the, uh, the remaining glue? No. Okay. Um, Very hard. Yeah, I might try gently using mineral spirits to start. That does seem of, of the different solvents to be the gentlest. And then try working your way up. Um, goof off is fairly strong, as is acetone. But I think if it's a semi-precious stone, if it's a natural stone, it should be OK. Um, you know, some stones are hydrophilic, like uh, opal, mm -hmm. where that could be very damaging. Um, I don't know. Any, any suggestions from? Uh, our guests or our uh, anybody in the audience? No. Um, maybe an exacto knife. Are you able to kind of cut or chisel any of it out? Without I can try that. Yeah, I can try that. 
maybe just to just to reduce it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep, you want to stay on and uh, Kathy is one of our uh, coaches, you may recognize her from last month's jewelry presentation. Um, uh, I have a comment. Yes. Uh, it's about tacky glue. I um, use it to apply fabric to something like cardboard or sometimes plywood. For example, on an old sewing machine case, like a vintage sewing machine case, you can thin it down with water. And uh, it's often too thick, you know, to use that, you know, straight out of the bottle for that. And the advantage of tacky glue is that it's tacky and you can reposition it and move it around and you know, pull it off and stick it back on again until you get it in the right place. So just wanted to say, you can thin it with water and paint it on with a paintbrush hmm. in that type of application. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, because I do find that it does, in the cases where I was trying to create a patch, um, my patch ended up thoroughly soaked with tacky glue because there was yeah. so much in a small area. Right, well, and you've got the water to deal with, but that will evaporate away. You know, it, it'll, go through the fabric and evaporate out if you're using it to apply fabric to something. Hmm. And, um, and Kathy, there are a couple suggestions came along in the, um, in the chat for you. Um, similar to what I had mentioned about trying to actually chip out the glue with a, yeah. a knife or, um, or something else. So, um, okay. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. see, I see Janine has raised her hand. And so we're going to uh, invite Janine to present her repair question. Okay, there you go. So I have um, several of these uh, stone tiles that are part of a, I emailed you about a week ago, yep. uh, that are part of a side table. And a lot of them have this glue that's stuck on the back of them. And I need to remove it. A lot of them are, are brittle and I've been able to peel them off. But some of them are stuck on there pretty hard and I don't know what's a good way to, I don't want to crack the stone in the process. Well, I guess the first question I would wonder is, do you really need to remove the old glue? Or with a couple of the glues that we talked about, would you be able to set the tile down and would it be flush with the other tiles? Yeah, that's what I'm concerned about, that I don't know if it's going to lay flat because yeah. there's like um, eight of these that fit together. Okay. You know, so you want them all to be on the same level right. as much as possible. So are you, is the glue flexible or is it you know, like a hard glue? This is a hard glue. Okay. So um, if you were to take a rag and soak it with one of the solvents that we talked about and then lay it on there for a period of time to see if that softens it. Hey, Tom, could you be quiet for a minute? Um, so um, we talked about the solvents being kind of in a, in a grade from the weakest with mineral spirits up to the strongest, which might be the goof off or acetone. Um, you know, try in a small area first. We want to make sure that you're not in any way damaging the tile. Um, but then allow it to sit and soak in for several minutes before then trying to remove it. And then you could try scraping it off with a putty knife. Um, might allow you to soften the glue enough to get it removed from the tile. Okay, um, goof off or acetone? Yeah, those would be the strongest ones. I might start with mineral spirits first, not knowing what kind of glue it is. Um, okay. But then, yeah, the goof off or the acetone would be the, the next step. Um, but you know, take it slowly, try a test area first so that you have an understanding of what you're working with. Um, you don't wanna do anything that might damage the tile or leave a stain or residue on the tile. Mineral spirits does tend to be a little bit more oily than the other two. The other two are sort of drier solvents. Um, and so that might be a reason not to use mineral spirits because it could stain the tile. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, goof off is a, is a strong one. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have suggestions? Um, about how to get that old glue off? No? Okay. I uh, do see something in the chat. Yeah, she says, Tom, oh, yeah. use thin set. Yeah, thin set um, is almost like a concrete. Is that, Pico, is that what you're thinking of? Is that right? Um, so, yeah, folks are also suggesting trying to remove it mechanically, like use a, a knife, uh, something to scrape it with. Um, right. Yeah, don't scrape your fingers. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, um, thanks for your question. Um, anything else, or we'll let you go? Uh, that's all, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. And Debbie, what is your question? Did you have a question? 
I have a stainless steel mixing bowl that was my mother's and it has a hole in it. Mm. And I, at one point, kind of sealed it up with that um, stuff that you need together, the two things. Yes. But it came out, and I don't know if it was actually food safe anyway. So what would you suggest for that? That is a tough one. Um, I would want to check if plastic uh, bonder from JB Weld is food safe. And if it isn't, Clear Weld is. What you could try doing is putting, so this is like a, a steel mixing bowl, right? So we yeah. want the interior to be smooth. So what yeah, you try doesn't. doing is take I'm a piece really. of um, packing tape, like a thick cellophane tape, and place uh -huh. that over the hole on the inside of the bowl. Okay. And then on the outside of the bowl, apply the, the two-part epoxy um, clear weld. Okay. Just, just a, a light coating so that it covers across the hole with the idea that after it sets up, you can peel the cellophane tape off of it. Okay. Um, and That's so then sure. you would have a smooth surface on the inside of the bowl. You might have a lump of the epoxy on the outside of the bowl. That's okay. How, uh, Debbie? Yes. How big is the hole? Oh, like about the end of a pencil lead, a kind of dull pencil lead. <laughs> Like a pinhole almost. Yeah, a little bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, 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 is, it, is the metal bent near where the hole is, or is it just a really clean, flat hole? No, it's pretty clean, hole, flat hole. I was just so surprised that stainless steel would even do that. <laughs> I would do what Don said. Okay. I would try that. It sounds to me, that would, that, would, that would hold, as long as you had a, a reasonably sized patch on the outside, that that should hold pretty well. It, will, it won't look... It won't look that great, but it should hold. I, I would yeah, guess. I don't care how it looks. It's I just I just want it to be functional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You guys have been help, very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I want to uh, give a shout out to Pico in the chat, who rightly um, identified that early in their presentation, I should have mentioned the importance of having a clean surface to bond any glue to, and um, I did neglect to highlight that fact. But um, yeah, anytime you're uh, working with um, you know, glue surfaces that you want to bond well, they should be clean and dry. Um, so Erin, I think you had a question for us. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I am curious about the environmental aspects of different glues. Um, I'm generally known as a textile mender, but I get a lot of questions from people about glue. And I use a lot of water-based glues, but you do have to um, wash the, remaining bits down the drain but then there's also you know if you clean up with solvents and stuff and then you've got paper towels or whatever you use to clean them up so i'm just curious um would you ever recommend or have you considered making your own homemade glues or if you had to pick like the most environmentally friendly whether it's because of like the packaging or less waste in the cleanup or any of that like what would you recommend from that perspective that's a good question i have to admit that i probably put the emphasis on repairing or salvaging the broken item more than the environmental cost of the glue. So, but I, I take your point that, um, you know, there are environmental effects. For instance, you know, these solvents do evaporate and then they're airborne and become part of the mix of, you know, our urban aerosol landscape. Um, I don't have a particularly good suggestion about any particular brand or packaging style that's better than another. Um, do any of our coaches or certainly if any of our guests have experience with this? Um, I would say um, if you can find a glue that, that serves your purposes for more things, then you're probably better off just buying one kind than buying multiple containers. That's a good point. So, um, you know, like the E6000 was one that came up quite a lot in our discussion tonight. Um, that might be a, a glue to go for, as well as glues that have longer shelf lives like Elmer's. Rather than having like six bottles of glue around you, about one or two. Right. Or, you know, or, or buying one for a project, keeping it for two years, and then throwing it away when the second project comes and you find out it's right. become solid. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I would agree with that. And I also, um, I also am very 
environmentally conscious and I keep about three to five glues in my house at the time at a, any given time um, and I usually handle my environmental impact by like they said buying a more general type of glue but also keep in mind if something you're repairing would be going into the waste stream anyways um, the glue that you do buy um, is offsetting what you're sending into the waste stream. So if you're you know, fixing a toaster or a MacBook charger like Don fixed earlier in the video, that MacBook charger going into a landfill has a pretty big environmental impact. Um, always remember to recycle your packaging. A lot of glues come with recyclable packaging these days, so remember to do that. Um, but it's a cost benefit analysis. And Aaron, it's not gonna be um, the same cost for every repair that you do. Um, so it may be more worthwhile at one time not to repair something you have um, than it is uh, for a future repair that you may hold dear to your heart um, and value highly. Oh, I totally agree. And in the case of Sugru, I always advocate to people to bank up all the things that need to be sugru so they don't waste an entire packet, you know, or, but I guess it's interesting with the E6000 because that's one of the glues I've never used and it's a much larger tube then crazy glue and if it does have a good shelf life you know then that's really appealing to me to even recommend to people to go look you're going to use it for lots of things it lasts a long time it's a big tube so there's less packaging like all those kind of things but yes i 100 percent agree becca i see that peter in the chat also has been advocating for sharing glues in a community you know like local libraries lending out glues um and local libraries are starting to lend out time on 3d printers um or pvc machines um so that would be very cool. Um, let uh, let us know if you get that going, Peter, because that'd be really interesting. Okay. Hey, um, anything else, Aaron? Uh, no, that's good for me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, and there was also a comment in the chat about Gorilla Glue. A um, couple of comments. I uh, I did ex decidedly exclude Gorilla Glue and silicone from my discussion tonight. Um, Gorilla Glue, the original Gorilla Glue, expands. And um, I don't like a glue that does things unpredictably. So I did, I don't, I don't keep it myself. I don't use it. Um, and so I did exclude it. Silicone is a little bit problematic. Um, it can't be painted. It can be difficult to, um, uh, to glue anything. If your silicone fails, nothing else sticks to silicone. So I did avoid that in our discussion tonight. I think there are a lot of other choices out there. So, um, so just to explain why I, I may have biases. And let's see. yes, um, I don't remember how long ago I bought them, but I bought a package of tiny little tubes of E6000. Oh, yeah, because I was familiar with you know how fast crazy glue seizes up, and I thought, um, I didn't realize that I could use a big tube for a long time, so you can get it in very, very small tubes. That's a good sug suggestion, yeah, thanks. Um, okay, let me just take a look at, uh, let's see, scrolling through our, does anybody else want to raise their hand to present a question? I see Wally has his hand up. Um, we also have one in our Q&A. Oh, we do. Okay, I didn't have that window open. Um, so, um, Becca did mention in the Q&A, we do ha did have a couple of questions come in. Um, one question was about using super glue in a first aid kit. And um, it is definitely a possibility to use. Um, I do want to highlight that, as we mentioned, super glue is not food safe. It is somewhat toxic. So I'm not going to recommend that you use it in a first aid situation. But um, it is, there is a version of super glue called Dermabond, which was approved by the FDA in 1998 right. and is used in emergency rooms and other places. It's not exactly the same formulation that you find in the hardware store, but it is, um, it is something, and you'll find pages by, uh, by authoritative health providers that say that you can use it to uh, fix small things, like a paper cut, for instance. Yeah. You could try to close. Um, a, sta a stab wound, seek medical attention. Yeah, so. <laughs> I've, I've occasionally suffered from very dry skin on my hands and get splits mm -hmm. on my fingers, and it's not uh, FDA approved use of a uh, particular product. Super glue is a great uh, way to bond that together until it 
heals itself. Let's see, there is um, other questions. Becca, did, was there something else that you we should touch on? Uh, yes, Mary Bingham says, yeah. I'm looking to make a fairy house. What type of glue would work to put a small stone onto a plastic bottle slash form? I don't know, I would probably say E6000 because that's my default answer for almost every question right now. Um, yeah, it depends on on the kind of fit. I mean, I, I did also have good success with um, with the super glues, but you really need kind of a, a tight fit. In this case, if you're kind of working with found materials, um, you might want to uh, use a, a glue that fills the gap a little bit better. And E6000 is nice for that. Hey, Don. Yeah. A couple quick things. One is glue related. One is kind of not. Um, I've had really good luck with uh, cords, like you used the super on. I've used gaffer tape, wrapped gaffer yeah. tape around it, and it doesn't yeah. get it doesn't get that weird sticky on it, and it really holds really really well. So I, I've got a I, I love it, and they're, it's kind of expensive, but I you know like seventeen bucks a roll, but gaffer tape is really great for lots of stuff. That's one so, thing. Tom, do I hear you signing up for a, the tape show? I could. Okay. Tape show. <laughs> the gaffer tape, I love. It's it's great because you can stick it on stuff and and peel it off, and it doesn't leave a residue. The other thing I'll mention, I did a quick look up on the glue, the, um, the, the, the clear bond, the JB Weld clear bond. You yeah. can get it in bottles. Okay. It, costs, it costs about three times as much, uh, two and a half times as much, but you get 17 times more glue. Hmm. So it's, it's much more economical if you're willing to, to spend $16 on two bottles versus spending $6 on two little bottles, on a little squeeze thing, which is probably what I'm going to do. Yeah, I will say that um, generally all the glues that I demonstrated tonight are very affordable. I mean, with the exception of Sugru, all under $10 and most of them under $5. So um, yeah, glue fortunately is a relatively cheap thing. A lot of competition. Um, oh, one of the glues that I didn't talk about tonight was um, uh, plastic model cement. So folks may be thinking of, you know, testers brand airplane glue. Um, I did go to Michael's to try to buy some, and that section of the store was completely wiped out. And I suspect that um, maybe with a lot of people at home um, trying to find things to do, um, there's been a run on testers, model cements, um, or they're having a supply chain problem. I don't know, but I couldn't get any. Uh, let's see. Do we have, uh, oh, we do have some folks that support the idea of you doing a tape show, Tom. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I could do that. <laughs> I yeah, we, no, really, we that sounds kind of cool, actually. Well, it's actually, um, I did have a, a polyethylene water tank I needed to fix a puncture in. And um, since I couldn't find any glue to fix polyethylene, and the only recommendation was to use heat welding, which is where you use a heat gun, basically an industrial hair dryer, to, to warm the plastic to the point of melting where you could patch it with another piece of polyethylene. I didn't want to mm -hmm. do that, so I bought Gorilla Tape. So... Not that I'm a, opposed to the entire Gorilla brand. Um, so I tried a piece of Gorilla tape and that seems to be holding. I haven't had any leaking since then. Maybe not food safe, but it works. Uh, let's see, Christine asks a question here. Um, would like to repair a tear and weakening seams on a vinyl boat seat. Becca mentioned vinyl cement. Any other suggestions? Um, I did do some uh, testing of E6000 on vinyl. I was really impressed with the results. And E6000 is, um, resistant to salt water. So that may be a good solution for boat seats. Okay, um, question, uh, Peter asks about contact cement. Um, yep, I didn't have time to include it in the presentation. It's part of uh, the glue show part two. Uh, the go-to contact cement that I like is Weldwood contact cement. Um, and I like to use that on uh, porous and non-porous large flat areas. So an example of using contact cement would be, for instance, if you have vinyl flooring that's stuck down on a wood subfloor and you have a piece of vinyl flooring that comes loose, um, a thin coating of contact cement on both pieces, allow it to dry for up to 20 minutes until it gets very tacky, and then set it down and you should get a permanent bond. Um, you may need to put a little bit of weight on it in case the vinyl floor curls a little bit. Um, nothing more than a telephone book. Um, careful that you don't have any glue that's kind of leaking out of the seams where you're going to glue your uh, weight down to the floor. So, uh, so that's, you know, contact cement in a nutshell. 
Um, that's typically where I would use it, a non-porous vinyl on a porous wood. Um, Pico asks where I got my Repair Cafe shirt. Um, several of us have had these made up by a local uh, uh, shop that does embroidery. Um, if you want to get one made locally near you, um, I can send you the uh, electronic files for that, I think. Um, just uh, send me an email. Um, let's see, comments on, uh, all right, do we have any uh, kind of general repair questions that are out there? Kind of off the one top. from your panelist. One yes, panelists. Chuck. Um, I've been anticipating this show because of uh, I have something that has been broken for quite a long time, and uh, now it's time to fix it for the next generation. If anybody can recognize the little Whoa. all over man. Oh, okay. You pull the ring, and he, but his base. Uh, separated a while ago and you can see the inside. Um, so I'd been, uh, you know, delaying doing anything about it because I thought it needs something with tremendous strength to place these, I don't know how well you can see it. It's three, three uh, barbed prongs coming down from the base. Okay. And, uh, uh, my wife and daughter had gotten some shoe grew uh, this past week, and I, I think that sounds like it might be just the thing to uh, to work and have right uh, a bulk strength of itself and adhesion to the other parts. So, thank you very much. Yeah, shoe goo is um, is made by the same company that makes E6000, and they are very similar formulations. So, rather than buy E6000, if you have shoe goo, yeah, give it a try. Yeah. Okay. So you're, I said I, I'm, I'm me. Sugru, not Shugru. Oh, 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 Sugru. Um, yeah. You know, I wasn't too sure about that. Um, let's see. I have, where is, okay. I have the sample. I don't know if it's visible on here. Uh oh, I broke something. No, I didn't. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see. I had a small piece of Sugru left, and I wanted to see what kind of adhesion properties it has to ceramic tile. And so I stuck down a little piece here. And it is surprisingly strong. Um, I have to say that, you know, the Sugru itself fails before I can get actually it off of the tile. Um, mm -hmm. And so as a, as a general purpose adhesive, it, it may have some value in a, in a situation like that. So yeah, maybe worth giving it a try. And then if it doesn't work, you can pick it off. Yeah. Just, okay. uh, but it is, it, is, it is pretty sticky. All right, I got it off. Yeah. So. Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, any other questions? All right, so in addition to answering your repair questions, you can uh, answer some questions for us. Um, as I mentioned, this is our last regularly scheduled uh, Repair Cafe TV episode originating from North Carolina. Um, there are other groups that are doing virtual workshops around the world. Um, what we've done recently in our Repair Cafe TV episodes is try to build them around a theme so we've had sewing machines, jewelry, glue, um, opening plastic cases, and other challenging fasteners. So um, if you have an idea, that something that you'd like to see explained, um, by all means, send us an email. You can write to repaircafenc, that's for North Carolina, at gmail.com, and send us your ideas of what you'd like to learn more about, and we can try to put together a show. Um, we've got quite a variety of talents among our repair coaches, so we'd be happy to uh, to try to put something together for you. Okay, so uh, so again, thanks everybody for being here. Thank you to all of our coaches and our guests, some great suggestions, as well as your email queries before the show. Um, we've got, uh, you know, our, we'll hopefully in 2021 be getting back to our regular in-person events for Repair Cafe. Here in the Triangle region of North Carolina, we do events in Durham and Cary. We have uh, a colleagues in the western part of the state that do events in um, Henderson, uh, I'm sorry, in Mills, in the Mills River area. Um, and then uh, we've got um, uh, Repair Cafe chapters all over the U.S. as well as around the world. You can visit repaircafe.org to find an interactive map to find a location near you. 
Um, so if we get back to doing these in 2021, we hope to see you there. And if not, then we'll see you again on one of these Repair Cafe TV episodes. So um, until then, uh, thank you everybody for coming out tonight and we'll see you all again soon.